I don't blame you for loving volumetrics like a brother. In fact, I think you should. And until this tutorial, yes, I'm making a claim, until this tutorial, we have not been able to access this kind of volumetric data in a way that we can start affecting things. I'm going to show you the method that lets you distort objects. You can do particle simulations. We're even going to be able to bend and twist a simulation after it's already done. Sounds good? I think it sounds good. Let do. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More about that later. In the preferences, make sure you have developer extras enabled. What this is going to do is it's going to enable this experimental section, which we need because you need to enable new volume nodes. And now that we're ready to go, I think it's always good to put a time crunch on this. So let's order a Chipotle burrito bowl. I just want to get this tutorial done before the burrito gets here. I'm now exposing how good or bad of a tipper I am. I'm not great. Oh, Chipotle isn't open. Gosh dang it. Okay. Guys, don't worry. Right after I finish recording, Chipotle was already open. So I got myself the meal, eating it while editing. Please do not be worried for me. To do this, we're going to need a volumetric simulation. Nothing to worry about. We can literally just run the quick smoke command that will set up a simulation for us. I'm just going to make something that will look a bit better. So I'm going to take my spawner and bring it down. And then I think the final thing is let's take this smoke simulation. I'm going to bump up the resolution to 64 by 64 by 64. Add border collisions of all kinds. Add a smidge of vorticity, which is going to add some detail. Okay, so now we have something a bit more interesting. Now, one of the key insights is we need to take this and convert it into a VDB so that we can control it in geometry nodes. How do we do this? Well, super simple. What Blender is doing under the hood is when you cache this, it is exporting to a VDB. So I'm just going to set this to all and you're going to see inside this volumetric data, we can indeed export open VDB. I'm going to save this cache somewhere I can remember and we are going to bake all. As this happens, you can see we get all this data. Specifically in the data folder, we have all of these VDBs that we can import and work with. Like I can just drag this VDB in here and now we have like this smoke object and we can modify it. Import, open VDB. Super cool thing about the importer. We can select a VDB, select all of them, and it will automatically import as a sequence that in this case is 250 frames long. Now, what I claim here is we can actually extract this velocity, this density data, and use it to like swirl curves or do all sorts of things. Let's add some geometry nodes. We know this is a volumetric object because I can do something like a volume to mesh, and you're gonna see it's gonna try to do its best to mesh it. But I wanna access like more particular data, specifically in the spreadsheet, you're going to see we have this new volume grids. This will only exist in Blender 5.0, maybe 4.5. We have the density, the flame, the shadow, temperature, and velocity. And you're going to notice that this has the word grid, which is new. So we have all of these new grid nodes, like we can get the info of a grid. We can sample a grid. We can also get a grid, store a grid. This is a new data type. Basically the same way that we can make an attribute on a point edge, face, whatever. Grid is the data type for volumetrics. You can think of it as storing data at a bunch of cells in three dimensions sampling at different points. I'm going to get the named grid. We need to say what volume are we using. We're going to use the input. And then for what I want to extract, let's do something like the density grid, which the information will now exist here. I'm going to sample the grid. So this is all very new, but it's pretty intuitive. I want to sample it on a bunch of points. One great way to do this is to distribute points inside volume. So that way we can use our volumetric to make a bunch of points. You're going to see it's going to be sporadic. I can change this to the underlying grid. And now you can see we basically have a grid of the data that we care about. And in particular, because we now sampled this grid, I can view the points with this density data. And now all of a sudden, you can see the density at every single point. And this can be with any data. Particularly, I care about the velocity grid, which is going to be a vector. It's telling us which direction is the smoke moving. I'm going to replace this with the word velocity. Make sure we're sampling a vector. And now if I view our points, we have all of this new data. You can see it's quite blue because it's rising up on the z-axis. This is great because if we know the movement of the volume, we can start to distorting things or advecting moving information along the grid. So let's do a bit of a demo to show you how this can be useful. Instead of points, I'm going to start off with a basic grid primitive, which I'm going to make bigger, way higher resolution. And I want to position this such that the grid is overlapping our volume. I'm going to transform. If we look at the side view, you can see it's kind of like diagonally off from the center. Turns out we can just translate this by I think it's minus minus two on the XYZ. And now what I'm claiming is we can actually distort the grid based on the smoke, kind of like pushing it up words. Particularly, we need to take our grid and move it at every single frame. So this isn't only going to be a set position, but it needs to update on every frame. So we're going to be using a simulation. During the simulation, I want to set position so that we can offset the position. We want to offset by how much the smoke is moving, which is exactly this velocity grid that we sampled. So I'm going to put this in the offset. Now, if we view this with the volumetric, it's going to go a bit crazy, but one is indeed affecting the other. Why is it moving so much? Why is it going crazy? Well, I did put in the velocity, but it doesn't care about how much time is passing. We want to change position based on this delta time. Velocity is equal
equal to distance over time. If I now multiply time by velocity, we get the distance or the offset. Two plus two is four, minus one, that's three, quick mess. Literally just scale the vector by this delta time. You can see this is now distorting in a way that makes a bit more sense. It does look absolutely whack because there's a lot of distortion, but it is working. If instead of a solid, I view this as a bunch of points, so I'm going to do a mesh to points node, you can now see that this is much easier to interpret. So we're moving the points along the volumetric. And in fact, there's no reason we need to inherit the velocity exactly. We could have totally taken our delta time, could have said, take this delta time and make it half as slow. So multiply by 0.5. You could think of this as basically stabilizing the simulation. And you can see the points are moving in ways that, you know, represent the volumetric. It's fair to say that the only thing better than volumetrics, the only thing is learning new skills and the sponsor of this video, Brilliant, is the way to do this. It's a online platform to learn mainly technical hard skills. We're talking math, programming, stuff like that. And unlike opening up a textbook, this process is fully interactive. So you're solving puzzles along the way. Apparently, this is proven to be a better way to learn. And this format is perfect for, you know, just using it. Or you can take it on the go. Here's a telephone because Brilliant is also available on mobile. A module I want to recommend is Python. If you're using Blender, you got to learn Python, either the basics or something more advanced. If all of this sounds good to you, there's going to be a link below along with the QR code somewhere that will give you a 30 days free trial to try it out. And if you like it, you're also going to get 20% off the annual membership. And now I think we're going to distort shapes if I remember correctly. Now, instead of having this kind of uniform grid where we have a bunch of lines on the X and the Y and it's super dense and it's hard to interpret, I want to look at more of cross section. So I'm just going to eliminate everything that isn't an x-axis line. I'm going to do this by taking our grid over here so we can modify it. But now the only difference is I am going to delete geometry, specifically edges. I want to delete the ones that are facing vertically. We can exactly get that information by looking at the edge data. So if I have a edge right here, it's going to have two vertices that define a direction. If I go from one to the other, position one, subtract away position two. So this will give us the direction. We can then know if this is facing vertically by taking the y component which is the one that faces up, and we check, is this greater than zero or really like 0 0.001? We're going to delete these corresponding edges, which you can see does nothing. It doesn't really work. And this is because right now, yes, we have a Y component, but most likely it is negative. Instead, I'm going to make this a less than negative 0 0.001, and now we've eliminated the lines. I'm going to turn this into a node group that I want to control the X and the Y resolution of custom grid, and we're just going to swap out this original grid with our custom grid view that. And just with that tiny change, you can see we're getting more like strings in a sense that we can stabilize and we will stabilize. One thing to consider is as this distortion gets crazy, we get a lot of sharp angles, which is what makes this look heavily, heavily distorted. And that is something we can fix by smoothing at every step. So I'm going to take our custom grid. Weirdly enough, I'm going to turn it into a curve. We like this because then we can resample, we can redistribute the points at every step. And then after offsetting the position, resample our curve with a count of 100 points. Let's see how much better this looks. So it goes like this, and now it remains much nicer and smoother. We can actually get even crazier with this because yes, it's well distributed, but we still get like quite sharp corners or edges, which you might remember there is a node to fix. That node is the fillet curve node. You're going to want to turn this into poly, limit the radius, and then bring up the counts. It's going to take every corner and add eight rounds of smoothing in some sense. Let's decrease the number of lines, which is going to be the resolution of the Y axis. And then with our fillet curve, we get something that's actually quite visible and we can see what's going on. I can take our speed and lower it even more. So it's going 20%. It's advected velocity. This should look substantially smoother and easier to follow. I remember I saw something like this on Twitter. So full credit to the person I cannot credit because I don't remember what it was. I think it was like many months ago, so I'm not going to be able to find it. I think one final thing I want to say before moving on to another demo is we took our volumetric, we shifted it, and then we extracted certain data. But then we had this weird sample grid that let us take our points and say, what was the velocity of the underlying volume? With that, we have a whole bunch of settings. We have trilinear and nearest neighbor quadratic. You could think of nearest neighbor as finding the closest volumetric cell, which is going to make this much glitch. Year. Whereas something like trilinear, imagine we have a point inside the cube. It's not just going to inherit the value of the cell, but instead it's going to look at these eight corners and it's going to do a sort of weighted average where a line like this one gets a lot of weight because it's right next to that corner, but one over here barely contributes. So we're interpolating. This is called trilinear. Triquadratic, on the other hand, is same idea, but we do this kind of smoothing with quadratics. Time for the next demo. So we have this volumetric and I want to do something weird to it. I want to twist it so that it kind of looks like a tornado. 
tornado. Now remember, this is already simulated. I'm not gonna add like a vortex force and re-simulate. I wanna take this and somehow modify it. Well, in theory, I just wanna look at the z-axis and we're gonna say as you travel up this, kind of take the density grid, which is what we're seeing, and do this kind of orbiting or rotating. I think you're gonna be surprised how easy this is. Just like before, we need to take our volumetric and we are going to extract the float value, which is called density. So we have our density. And I wanna transfer this to a different volumetric. What I want is I wanna take our volume cube, which just looks like this. It's just a volumetric cube. You can make it bigger, smaller, whatever. What I like about it is it has this density value, specifically it's a field that we can mess with. We are now going to sample the grid just like before, and I'm going to take this density and plug it in here. As you might expect, our volume cube is now going to inherit this. The only issue is our initial volumetric was much bigger than the cube, so I'm just going to bring this up until it's pretty much the correct boundary, and let's take the resolution and again make it 64, and now we have the same data, but this time it's stored inside our volume cube. Now here is where we get tricky, so you're going to see we have this position I didn't talk about. If I plug in just the normal position, you're going to see nothing happens. If I take our position and do an offset, so I'm just going to add some value, connect that in here, and then do a bit of an offset, you can see we're now kind of moving our grid without doing a transform. Really, I'm just sampling the grid as if I was off to the side, so I'm sampling at different positions. Okay, that's cool, but can we get crazier? We can get as crazy as we want, so I can take a vector rotate such that now we have a rotation. And remember, I said that a tornado is basically rotating as we go up the z-axis. Take our position, I can extract this z-axis value, and turn this into the angle, which you're going to see, it's a little hard to tell what happened here. I'm going to make that a bit more dramatic by multiplying. And now you can see we get this kind of twisting. And note that we didn't re-simulate anything. We just kind of twisted it. What if instead I just wanted to kind of bend it, so rotate it about a different axis? Well, in this case, we're going to be rotating about the y-axis, so just like that. To get this to kind of curve, I want to make sure the center point is right here so that we're rotating about kind of like the minimum point. So let's just do a bit of a rotation, and then I'm going to move the center down until it kind of looks right. I'm also going to move it a little on the X so it makes more of an arc. We didn't like pick the exact right values, but we're now distorting a volumetric so it's flowing to the side, you know, that easily. Additionally, let's get even crazier. Imagine we simulated this but without much detail. Can we add detail for free? We totally can. Take this position, and I'm going to add a bit of randomness. Particularly, I want to do this via a continuous noise texture. So plug in the color, make sure that you disable normalize. This will keep it kind of centered at zero now. Connect this into the position, bring down the scale so it's not as intense, maybe add a bit of detail and a bit of roughness. And let's just kind of scale the contribution here. So instead of kind of having full power, I just add a little bit of scale. We've now essentially added a free detail pass, which we can also make velocity dependent. It's going to be super slow and maybe the recording is glitchy, but this is what they look like side by side. So they have the same kind of underlying structure, but now just with the kind of free hit of detail that didn't require simulating. And you can do all kinds of things with this. You can have it fork, you can move particles, you can have it advect information. Sample grid. We love the grids. As always, you can get the blend files that I've made, a cleaned up version of this, by going to cgmatter.com. That's where I upload all the blend files. Link below if you're interested. By the way, if you didn't see the last video, I've been cutting things out of metal recently. Here's a bit of a clearer result with like wood stock, so you can see in Suzanne We Trust. I've been making coins, and I'm going to try to make something more interesting, maybe make it a, a product if people...